Welcome back, everyone, to our third session of today's program uh, on the issue of abortion in American public life. I think you will hear that these wonderful panelists define public life broadly, um, not only to include the law, but also political parties, social movement organizing, um, and, uh, and religious and sacred life. Um, it's my job to introduce the moderator of the session, uh, Professor Andrew R. Lewis, uh, from the School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Cincinnati, and author of the award-winning book, The Right's Turn in Conservative Christian Politics, How Abortion Transformed the Culture Wars. Thank you so much for being with us, Andy, not only um, today, but over many years of planning. And um, I turn it over to you to introduce your panelists. Well, thank you, Jane. Uh, and it's just been a delight to sit and listen and engage with the panelists and the audience members in the discussions. Today, our panel is going to engage with uh, the legacy of Roe versus Wade in American public life. And as I think most of us know, since we are here, like Roe is quite possibly the most recognized Supreme Court case in American public life. But as we've all been discussing, it is not the most recognized necessarily for its legal doctrines or its discussions of the trimester framework or the 14th Amendment's uh, protection of privacy or uh, viability or those sorts of legal technicalities, but for something much more, right? Much more about our politics. Uh, Mary Ziegler here on the front has written that it's a, in some sense a flashpoint for these deeper struggles that we have in American politics. And that may include things like motherhood and health care, race and gender, sexuality and science, uh, the discussion of rights in, in our discourse, the discussion of equality, uh, the place of religion in American public life, and so many other things that we have discussed. Today, our panelists are going to focus primarily on three of those deeper struggles. I would say religion, gender, and science. But I also submit to you that we are going to investigate the way those deeper struggles intersect with one of our most intense uh, parts of our American public life, and that is partisanship and politics and polarization. And so we will examine the way that these deep struggles are engaged with our politics. And uh, just a little bit of background on that. I mean, when Roe is decided, there is probably little dif distance between the two political parties on the politics of abortion. Over the next decade, those parties start to distinguish themselves and activists start moving in what we might call polarized directions. The decade after that, we get the mass public moving in a more polarized direction. And so much so that when we think about public opinion on abortion, one of the characteristics is, is stability. If you look at sort of long-term public opinion, until lately, it's been quite stable in the aggregate. But underneath that stability is massive partisan difference that has developed. And in fact, the greatest public opinion divide is much more than gender or other things is the partisan difference in public opinion regarding abortion. And so we're going to sort of investigate that and investigate how partisanship and politics intersect with some of these struggles to shape and uh, public life regarding abortion. Um, I will say that we have scholars here that are representing different disciplines. So we have two historians, we have a law professor, I'm a political scientist, and so we will come at this from slightly different disciplinary approaches. I will encourage you to think a bit about the directionality of influence that may be going on. So something like, how do we see the politics of abortion shaping our broader political landscape? But at the same time, how does our partisan politics also shape the abortion movement, either the pro-life side or the pro-choice side. We should also think a good bit about development. And these, the, the context we are in today in the post dobbs world did not just develop out of nowhere, but it has, there is a process of activism uh, and successful and failed attempts that have shaped the political world we're in. And so in many ways, I think our panelists will encourage us to think about that development and then it'll hopefully give us thoughts about what may develop in the near future. 
With that, that's probably enough for me until we get to the question and answer side. I will say, um, as we have done in the past, the audience members are welcome to submit questions at any time during this uh, session, and we will get to as many as we can. As you can imagine, there will probably be lots of things that will interest you and our panelists. Um, whether you're watching on per in person or online, you can use the uh, Slido link that's either on your Zoom screen or behind us to submit questions, and we will do our best to get to those. Let me introduce our distinguished panelists. Their full bios are in the online program, and so I cannot do them justice here, but we have three distinguished panelists. The first is Professor Kristen Cobes dumay and she is uh, the Spielhoff Chair and Professor of History and Gender Studies at Calvin University. Our second speaker will be uh, Aziza Ahmed, who is the R. Gordon Butler Scholar in International Law at the Boston University School of Law. And finally, Daniel K. Williams, who is Professor of History at uh, West Georgia University. With that, let's welcome Professor Dumay. <clears throat> Since I'm a historian, let me start with a bit of background. There's diversity in Christian history around the question of abortion. But dating back to the early church, various theologians have declared abortion sin or murder. More recently, history shows us that in the United States, abortion before quickening was supported by state laws into the 1860s and 70s, and it was a common practice in a predominantly Christian nation. Initially in this country, most abortions were procured by young, poor, and unmarried women. After 1840, we see a rise of medical abortions among middle and upper classes. Male doctors led efforts to criminalize abortion. They argued that life began at conception. They were also concerned that married, respectable Protestant women were among those seeking abortions. And many were concerned to establish their own professional authority by diminishing the role of midwives. In the late 19th century, many women's rights activists opposed abortion, but promoted voluntary motherhood, by which they meant the right of women to control their sexual relations in such a way as to control their pregnancies. The downside here was that most women married or not have very little power to do so. In my own research into Protestant women's rights activists during this era, I very rarely came across even the mention of abortion. Contraception was a matter of debate. Sometimes it was accepted, but it was often resisted in part for its connection to social hygiene, eugenics, and the coercive power of the male medical establishment and the state. But abortion was rarely spoken of. It was, uh, but just because Christian women might not speak of it does not mean that Christian women were not procuring abortions. And through the first half of the 20th century, there is a lot of silence around abortion. Some fundamentalist pastors declared abortion murder, but most Protestant ministers did not weigh in on abortion, preferring to leave it to doctors. Now, before I move on to the more recent era, I want to note that if you wanted to use history to make a case either for or against pro-choice or pro-life positions, you can do that from the evidence that I've just shared here, if you're careful in what you pick. And this is worth keeping in mind as we move forward to the recent era. So from the 1960s on, we see a shift to a rights-based movement and one enmeshed in the broader culture wars. Here, too, a few interesting facts. In 1968, Christianity Today, the flagship magazine of American evangelicals, published a special issue on abortion and contraception. It's sitting on my desk in my office. Is abortion right or wrong? The answer, it's complicated. They refuse to characterize it as necessarily sinful, citing, quote, individual health, family welfare, and social responsibility as justifications for ending a pregnancy. Uh, this issue includes a fascinating article, a theological uh, assessment of the question of ensoulment. When does a, a soul enter a fetus? In 1971, an SBC, Southern Baptist Resolution, calls for laws to affirm, quote, the sanctity of human life, including fetal life. But it also called for laws that allowed abortion under conditions of rape, incest, fetal deformity, and evidence of likely damage to the emotional, mental, and physical health of the mother. In 
In 1974, 90% of Texas Baptists believed their state's abortion laws were too restrictive. Following the Roe decision, a prominent SBC pastor explained, I have always felt it was only after a child was born and had life separate from its mother that it became an individual person. And it has always therefore seemed to me that what is best for the mother and for the future should be allowed. And even as late as 1981, a Southern Baptist Commission spoke of, quote, concern for the value of the defenseless fetus, but also questioned whether, quote, Christian love and justice would be served by extremely restrictive laws which do not give conscientious people with proper medical advice the opportunity to choose when they are faced with very grave moral dilemmas related to abortion. But by then, this sort of nuance is becoming increasingly rare as a pro-life orthodoxy takes hold. Over the course of the 70s, the terms of the conversation shift. And here, context is important. First, the response to Roe. In the words of one Baptist leader, I think the carnage, by which he's referring to the increased abortion following Roe v. Wade, drove them back, evangelicals back, to their Bibles to take a further look at it. But it wasn't just Roe, and here broader context matters, the family values politics of the era. And first we need to step back a little bit earlier to the 1950s, Cold War era, uh, era of breadwinner liberalism, gender traditionalism, right? These values widely held, particularly among the white middle classes and supported by government intervention. During this time, we see white evangelicals moving from the margins of American society in terms of American public life closer to the center. This is when Billy Graham is in and out of the Eisenhower White House. Then the 1960s happen. Civil rights movement, anti-war movement, feminism, sexual revolution, rising divorce rates, all of these things threaten traditional white Christian values. And evangelicals, uh, th th these disrupt evangelical social values, but it also, the shift displaces evangelicals culturally and socially. Okay, so the response, they doubled down on the Christian family, the heterosexual patriarchal family unit as a foundation of society, and gender difference is key here. Men wield patriarchal authority, they are providers, protectors, women are meant to be wives and mothers and to submit to masculine authority. Now feminists, meanwhile, at this time had started championing the right to abortion as key to women's liberation from precisely these things. And then we need the context of the political mobilization of conservative evangelicals. And Dan's gonna speak um, uh, on that with much more detail. Um, but you may be familiar with the thesis that the real roots of the religious right lie not in defense of a, the of a fetus, but in defense of racial segregation. Anti-abortion was deemed more palatable than their real motive, so this thesis goes, that protecting segregated schools. Now, it is true that segregation mobilized evangelicals politically before abortion did. However, abortion is not merely proxy for white evangelical racism. This thesis, more popular among pro-choice activists than among historians, neglects a longer Christian pro-life tradition, the role of eugenics in the history of abortion, as we have heard this morning, and it fails to appreciate the context of the 1970s with its oppositional emphasis on traditional gender roles in the service of Christian nationalism. What does Christian nationalism have to do with this? Within the Christian right, abortion as a moral issue is connected to the nation. The country's laws must reflect God's laws, if the country is to, fill, to fulfill its destiny as God's chosen nation, and if it is to secure God's blessing. So we can't just agree to disagree on this. Over the 1970s and 1980s, evangelicals like Francis Schaeffer and Jerry Falwell Sr. worked hard to instill these truths. By 1980, the Southern Baptist Convention had rescinded the limited endorsement of legalized abortion. And this is bringing us to our kind of present era. And so from that time to the present, a few things uh, to know. Anti-abortion is at the heart of white evangelical identity. 
despite polling that suggests that abortion doesn't in fact top the list of priorities for evangelical voters in any given election, at least this was before uh, very recent times, it comes behind economic issues and things like foreign policy, this doesn't quite ring true to those who know this subculture well because it serves not just as an issue but as a moral linchpin. It gives moral cover to the entire Republican agenda and opponents are demonized, sometimes quite literally. Anti-abortion infuses evangelical popular culture, not as a topic open for debate, but as a moral absolute and marker of Christian identity. Pastors and youth groups, Christian radio, music, material culture, all of this creates and sustains this new orthodoxy. Abortion in this discourse is not a complicated moral, theological, and medical issue. It is a clear and simple moral choice. Making abortion illegal reflects this moral absolute in a way that addressing structural issues like accessible contraception, health care, family leave, and child care do not. So what does this mean post Dobbs? For generations, opposing Roe didn't just mobilize evangelical voters. Opposing abortion became central to their moral and political identity, and this hasn't changed. Post Roe, they now have state-level battlegrounds on which to play out this moral battle. And how did evangelicals respond to Dobbs? With praise and thanksgiving. And among a certain set, the uh, Trump base, with um, kind of a aggression against uh, the non-Trump base of white evangelicals. If you think of that notorious 81% of white evangelicals who voted for Trump, that leaves 19% who did not. And I was seeing a lot of this ends justifying the means rhetoric among the pro-Trump group, uh, forcing, demanding that the never Trump evangelicals apologize or even grovel before them in light of the Dobbs decision. But it also has revealed divisions. Now that it's not hypothetical, is it really such a clear-cut issue? Do we prosecute women or just providers? Right? Trump kind of came out on this and then backpedaled, and I was actually surprised that this was a point of disagreement inside evangelical spaces simply because of the rhetoric that I had heard, which was so extreme. Are there any exceptions? Survey data suggests that the majority of white evangelicals do allow for some exceptions, but rhetorically this is harder to sustain. And so there's a kind of growing abolitionist movement, no exceptions ever. And this is more consistent with defining it in stark moral terms because rape doesn't justify murder. For many evangelicals, Christian nationalism continues to frame their understanding of abortion. It is about life and it is about reflecting God's order for society, and these values cannot be compromised. 74% of white evangelicals, more than any other religious group in this country, believe that abortion should be always or nearly always illegal. Understanding why is key to finding a way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, next, we have, have Aziza. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to, here today. Thank you to Jane and Becky and Mary, um, the organizers, um, to, to Andrew for organizing us. Um, when Roe was decided 50 years ago, black men elevated the role of the physician, the expert, the scientist, and reproductive rights activists listened. Black men put doctors on the side of choice. Many reproductive rights activists took this for granted over the next 50 years. We would see a fight in which the next step was clear. Get the court to understand the medicine and the science, and they, the judges would do the right thing. Conservatives have noticed this also, and they noticed this then at the time of Roe, and have used the last 50 years to endorse a new strategy, to become the experts. As we sit here today, gathering to understand the tectonic shift between Roe and Dobbs what this means for the, and what this means for the future, I'd like to focus our attention for a few minutes on, on the question of how in these past 50 years we have witnessed an explosion of debates on abortion in the register of science and public health. As a legal scholar focusing in on this question of abortion, I'm particularly interested in asking how the law, and, and I'll focus on the courts today, engages in these scientific and expert claims, engages with these scientific and expert claims, and today I'd like to propose a reframing. What if we took a cue from science and technology st uh, studies scholars, and instead of seeing law and science as two distinct and separate forms of authority, as progressives frequently do, 
and reproductive rights advocates absolutely do. We see the court as a legitimator and maker of facts, rather than gatekeeping, as suggested by a body of work around judges as gatekeepers and false, uh, false information, and a large literature on what's called the Daubert Standard, in case you're a legal nerd. We saw them as endorsers and makers of knowledge. Doing this will allow us to see how the courts code political decisions and technical and purportedly neutral expert knowledge, and how they have reset the playing field by treating various forms of competing expert claims as equal. By following the path of these contested expert claims and seeing who the courts choose to hold up, we can see how the court has reset and legitimated various ideas with wide implications, um, which have contributed to how we've arrived today with Dobbs, and not only in the legal sense with Dobbs, but also um, for the practice of medicine. And of course, the impacts of this we've already heard about and go far beyond when thinking about the political economy of abortion access, impacts that are most affecting poor women and immigrant women, black and Latino women who struggle the most to access abortion. So to illustrate the larger point I'm trying to make, I thought I would trace the path of scientific, the scientific and epidemiological battle about abortion's mental health consequences, and then think through how we might learn some lessons from that story in the post dobbs moment, what we might pay attention to as a similar set of questions continue to arise about expertise, science, and experience, and is changing the abortion landscape. So I'll begin with a recent example on the claim to negative mental health outcomes after abortion. After Dobbs, prosecutors in Michigan considered whether or not they should prosecute providers under a 1931 abortion ban that was still on the books. The governor of Michigan and Planned Parenthood sought and were eventually awarded a temporary restraining order against the application of the law. Support from the law came from a variety of places, but testimony was also provided by an Ohio professor who frequently writes and publishes on the issues of mental health, the mental health impacts of abortion, the negative mental health impacts, I should say. Drawing on her research, whose claims and those similar to hers have been questioned time and again by leading researchers, including the Guttmacher Institute and the American Psychological Association, she testified that abortion causes various forms of mental health distress. After considering cross the cross-examination and her answers to the questions, the judge offered her testimony no weight, dismissing it entirely, and made his decision to issue the restraining order. But a question remains. How and why did this even become a claim that could be made? One place to begin to unravel the story is in the early 1980s when the Supreme Court overruled an Akron, Ohio regulation that providers be mandated to give additional information, additional informed consent in the context of abortion. This required the telling, that telling women their abortions would have negative mental health consequences. The declaration of this law is unconstitutionally wouldn't stop conservatives. Advocates had also been pushing, to pu had been pushing to pass more informed consent laws and continue to despite now their unconstitutionality. These informed consent statutes would allow, would allow and require abortion providers to give additional information about the purported consequences of abortion and, and imp potential impact on the fetus including that, including that, that medical, that, including that med mental health consequences would, uh, would follow from an abortion. With Reagan, new opportunities also emerged. The anti-choice Everett Koop was now Surgeon General. Perhaps there was new opportunities here. Koop was asked by Ronald Reagan, very famously, to explore the impact of mental health, uh, to implore, explore the impact of abortion on mental health. The quest was contrary to what had been expressed in Roe, Remember, in which Blackman noted that women might self suffer consequences, mental health consequences, from an unwanted pregnancy. The request, however, was in line with this new claim. What if it was abortion that caused negative mental health consequences? And in a now famous letter, Coop wrote to Ronald Reagan that there was no evidence to make the claim that abortion did or did not cause mental health consequences. Following the letter, many experts weighed in to say that there was, in fact, a lot of evidence to show that there was no mental health consequences, including the head of the CDC at the time. But the lack of evidence that Coop spoke about, coupled with the discounting of the evidence that existed, created an opportunity for some, an opportunity to make the facts that they wanted to hear. In the meantime, at least one of the informed consent laws passed in Pennsylvania in the 1980s would arrive before the Supreme Court again in KCV Planned Parenthood. Over the brief of the American Psychological Association again, noting that adverse mental health consequences to abortion are rare, the judges in Planned Parenthood versus Casey upheld the provisions that would require providers to say that abortion has detrimental psychological effects as constitutional, and in doing so, helped to legitimate the idea. The plurality decision didn't stop there, however. They go on to note that they find that requiring the provision of information is permissible if it is truthful and not misleading. <laughs> 
But claims to truth sometimes require science and studies and experts. And so bloomed a cottage industry in which attempts were being made to make a link between abortion and negative mental health consequences. This movement received a gift from the Supreme Court in 2007 when Justice Kennedy noted, in keeping with the plurality in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, there was no question that, an abor that abortion could cause regret, severe depression, and issues with self-esteem. Now, despite this plethora of new studies, debunked repeatedly for methodological and other issues, Justice Kennedy did not cite to them, but instead to a brief filled with affidavits produced by Operation Outcry, an anti-abortion organization that contained statements by women who wrote about their negative reactions to abortion. The idea that women regretted their abortion went on to provide fodder for an ongoing ex and excessive informed consent laws in the context of abortion. And even as some challenge or even dismiss these views as happened in the recent case of Michigan, they have served, the, they have served their purpose covering the pretext that law or regulations, that the law and regulations at play are actually going to benefit women. The story of competing truth claims in the abortion context, especially around mental health, is, an, is, an, is a powerful study, I think, of how new knowledge is legitimated and adjudicated through the, in the context of abortion. And it's not alone. Fetal personhood, the necessity of surgical procedures, viability, each calls upon experts, lay experts, science, and medicine. In some ways, Dobbs ignored these debates. Unlike the decision in Dobbs, I should say, unlike Roe, which started us down the path of an expert-driven discussion of abortion access, listen to the doctors, listen to the experts, the Dobbs decision did not suggest abortion was an issue of experts, either lawyers or doctors. Instead, it, it threw the issue back to the people vis-a-vis -vis state legislatures. It was and has become a nearly unanswerable moral question that one must battle through the political process. Now abortion could be regulated through the legislature almost without the need to reference the reality that it's a medical issue, despite new evidence that doctors are waiting longer and longer to intervene in crisis pregnancy situations causing harm and, and negative mental health outcomes. So where are we today? How have these fights that I described in the mental health context around abortion and around knowledge formation and creation and the politics of science setting the stage for battles to come? While the terms of the debate and forms are changing, we see familiar fights around medical, medicine and regulation teeing up. In the case of medication abortion, for example, in which feminists and healthcare providers demand that medication abortion be easier to access, those supporting regulation, once again, use the pretext of protection through drug regulation as an opportunity to limit access. Making this claim and carrying it through should be easy for feminists. Science is on the side of feminists and, and as well as on the side of most providers. But, the, but those who want to regulate abor uh, medication abortion access stand on strong ground. Most of you will remember that in the 1990s, there was a big battle around the arrival of RU486 20 years ago, mired in politics. And it, and it is a story of the Food and Drug Administration bending under conservative pressure to begin excessively regulating a drug that should be easier to access. Second, we will be asking ourselves, who are the legitimate experts? What we see is not only a battle, but a strategic deployment of expert deference by the court. The Supreme Court showed how this worked on January 12, 2021, when over the pleas of physicians and practitioners, experts, they ceded to the FDA as the primary authority on abortion, and in turn allowed for the continued regulation of abortion that would require women to go in person to get medication abortion at the height of, at one of the heights, I should say, of the pandemic. Sotomayor's dissent teed up a different group of experts. She nodded to the idea that we should be paying attention to women of color, um, and echoed the testimony of Sister Song, a reproductive justice organization. She reminded the courts, too, that others, like the CDC and physicians, have expertise and recommended other paths forward. We have to ask ourselves, as I just said, how is the court deploying experts to serve political means? And finally, we should ask ourselves about the shifting landscape of lay experts. In women's health organizing, for and against access to abortion, personal stories, testimony, and experience has been a powerful tool for change. The history of women's organizing, as powerfully shown even in this conference, um, as the lay expert, the woman who has had the experience of an abortion, offers a counter um, to anti-choice rhetoric. And around the world, countries lib have liberalized their abortion laws. In Argentina and Mexico and other places, it has often been the impact on pregnant women that have changed the minds of conservative legislatures. But in the United States, these horror stories have not had the impact one would desire. Instead, the voices of organizations like Sister Song are written out of the story, as we saw in FDA versus ACOG, the case I just mentioned, or in Dobbs, in which the stories of women are not considered at all, or in Carhartt, where stories uh, uh, produced by Operation Outcry are used to legitimate claims of regret.
So this is a panel on American public life, and my focus on courts and experts is not meant to distract us from this theme, but instead to serve to place, to instead serve to place the courts and experts inside of society, inside of American private life and public life, in which facts are made and remade, adjudicated, where claims are legitimated by courts and by us, where voices can be silenced or lifted up in the courts, and why, where, while it might take decades, what we claim to be truth can really change beneath our feet. Thank you. Thank you, Aziza. Uh, Dan, you're next. OK, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, in many ways, my paper is going to uh, overlap a bit with Kristen's, and I, I hope uh, complement it. Uh, I think, uh, in many ways, the story that we're looking at is similar. And so some of the uh, details that I'll mention may uh, be something that you've, you've heard about before. But what I'm going to try to do is to link this story with partisan politics and to ask the question, how did we get to the place that we are today in terms of uh, thinking about uh, abortion policy and voting on abortion policy? A lot of things have changed since the time of Roe. And to just give you a picture as to how, those, how great those changes have been, I want to take you back to 1971 if you were to look at the United States in 1971, you would see that the political and religious landscape of the abortion debate looked very different than it does today. Here in Massachusetts, a Unitarian who was a Harvard Divinity School professor was serving as the founding president of Americans United for Life. And one of the US senators from Massachusetts, liberal Democratic Senator Ted Kennedy, endorsed the pro-life cause in that year and said that Americans had a duty to, quote, protect life from the moment of conception. And indeed, even as late as 1973, only about 10% of the members of the Massachusetts State Legislature favored the legalization of abortion. Immediately before Roe v. Wade, Massachusetts had one of the most restrictive abortion laws in the nation, more restrictive, in fact, than the state abortion law in Georgia, South Carolina, or Arkansas. But in the Sun Belt, one of the nation's best-known conservative Republicans, Barry Goldwater, endorsed abortion legalization. And as we heard, even the Southern Baptist Convention called on members of the denomination in 1971 to work for the legalization of abortion in cases of rape and incest and dangers to a pregnant woman's health. Well, what happened? How did the New England states, where anti-abortion sentiment was strong in the early 1970s, become some of the strongest supporters of abortion rights? And how did the conservative South which was moderately supportive of abortion law liberalization before Roe, become a stronghold of anti-abortion sentiment? How did both the Democratic and Republican parties come to adopt stances on abortion that were at odds with the sentiments of some of their leading members in the early 1970s? And how did the Southern Baptist Convention move from a position of moderation on abortion to a supporter of abortion abolition, as they would term it, that is a call for abortions to be treated as murder in every circumstance, with no exceptions. I believe that the key to explaining all of these developments is religion, and specifically the conversion of evangelical Protestants to the pro-life cause. And of course, Kristen spoke at some length on this, and, and she alluded to some theories that are out there as to how uh, this shift happened. What I hope to do is to complicate that discussion a little bit. It's going to be very brief, of course, there's a lot more that I could say and have said elsewhere, uh, but I hope that this will provide at least a surface level answer and begin a conversation. So in most other Western countries around the world, pro-life movements are overwhelmingly Catholic. And as a result, the influence of the pro-life cause in any given country is directly proportional to the percentage of the population that is devoutly Catholic and theologically conservative. And before Roe v. Wade, it looked like the same phenomenon might be true in the United States as well. The nation's largest pro-life organizations were overwhelmingly Catholic, and the states with the strongest pro-life sentiment were generally Catholic states. Rhode Island, the most Catholic state in the nation at the time, was one of the last holdouts against bringing its state abortion law into conformity with Roe v. Wade. Because public opinion on abortion in the early 1970s was correlated more closely with religion than with political party, and because a majority of Catholics were Democrats. In fact, among Catholics, Democrats outnumbered Republicans by two to one. Many pro-life activists held 
liberal beliefs on economic questions that were associated with the Democratic Party. Though mostly very traditional on issues related to sexual ethics and gender, a number of pro-life activists in the early 1970s leaned toward the left on issues of war, poverty relief, and government social programs, and I should say some still do, it's just a, it, it has become a smaller minority of the pro-life movement. Their holistic approach to human life questions, which for some included opposition to the Vietnam War, capital punishment, nuclear arms buildup, in addition to abortion, reflected Catholic social teaching far more than it did the platform of the Republican Party. When the Democratic Party endorsed abortion rights, as it would start to do in 1976 and then uh, do so more forcefully in the 1980s, some pro-life Catholics who, who had been Democrats decided to leave the party. But the real partisan shift in abortion politics in the United States came not primarily because of a shift of culturally conservative Catholics to the GOP, but because of a change in evangelical politics. Culturally conservative Catholics who insisted on voting pro-life were a minority in the nation's heavily Catholic areas, especially after the aftermath of Vatican II, combined with a later reaction against the Catholic Church's sexual abuse crisis, reduced church attendance and Catholic identification rates in much of the North and especially the Northeast uh, in this very area. After the 1980s, in no state were conservative Catholics a large enough percentage of the population to turn the state into a bastion of anti-abortion politics. The closest such state might have been Pennsylvania, which retained a tradition of electing pro-life Catholic Democrats to statewide office longer than, than most other states. But even in Pennsylvania, pro-life Catholics were not a large enough percentage of the population by the early 21st century to succeed in restricting abortion access in the state uh, after Dobbs. By contrast, evangelical Protestants who opposed abortion did have enough regional political influence to change abortion politics in several states. In the 1970s, evangelical Protestants were disproportionately concentrated in the South, but with substantial influence in the Midwest as well. Over the next half century, up to today, Evangelical influence in the Midwest diminished to some degree, but remained very high in the South, an influence that kept church attendance rates and degree of religious adherence much higher in the South than in most of the North, which was experiencing declining church attendance and religious affiliation rates. And it was at this moment when the North and South began to diverge sharply in their rates of religiosity that opposition to abortion became a signature cause of a disproportionately Southern evangelical Protestantism. When abortion became a topic of political debate in the late 1960s, many evangelicals at first reacted with cautious moderation, as, as Christian explained. Unlike Catholicism, evangelicalism lacked a strong tradition about abortion or the point at which human life began, perhaps because the Bible never mentioned abortion directly and offered only a few scattered references to prenatal human life, many of which could be interpreted in multiple ways uh, depending on the uh, interpreter. Christians who assigned authoritative weight to early church tradition could point to much clearer denunciations of abortion in early non-canonical Christian writings, such as the second century Didache. But for evangelical Christians whose primary or sole religious authority was the Bible, and this was especially true among evangelicals in the early 1970s, it was harder to find a definitive proof text for an absolutist stance on abortion. But evangelicals opposed the sexual revolution overwhelmingly. And even if some of them were willing at first, in the, that is in the late 1960s and early 1970s, to allow for abortion in cases of rape, incest, and perhaps dangers to a pregnant woman's health, most of them, even at that point, opposed elective abortion, or as they called it at the time, abortion on demand. After Roe v. Wade mandated the legalization of elective abortion nationwide in the first or second trimesters of pregnancy, evangelicals found it easy to denounce the decision as both Christianity Today and the National Association of Evangelicals did in 1973. At first, most evangelicals who opposed abortion saw abortion legalization as only one part of a larger constellation of evils, such as pornography or the sexual revolution. And they did not necessarily make candidate stances on abortion a political litmus test in the 1970s. But by the end of the 1970s, a growing number of evangelicals began to view Roe as the symbol of both secularization and the sexual revolution and therefore the symbol of all the moral evils they opposed. In my, my writings elsewhere, I've talked about Francis Schaeffer's role in that. Uh, I won't do that for reasons of time today. In many ways, Roe was not necessarily a secular decision, but rather a liberal Protestant one. It was written by a devout Methodist, Harry Blackman, and it closely paral paralleled statements on abortion that appeared in the Christian century and other ecumenical Protestant publications at the time. It gave a lot of weight to the 20th century liberal Protestant value of personal moral responsibility, 
that is, the right of an individual to make responsible moral decisions without coercion from law or the church. Evangelical Protestants, by contrast, did not share this liberal Protestant view of individual moral autonomy, and they saw Roe as a symbol of moral relativism, in addition to being a symbol of all the other things that they opposed. In their view, the Supreme Court and the pro-choice movement had abandoned the moral laws of God as absolute standards. They, the court and the pro-choice movement, they thought, had accepted the premises of the sexual revolution and feminism, and they had devalued human life in their view and opened the floodgates to a practice that would soon, they predicted, lead to the deaths of other groups that were considered marginal or unnecessary. Many uh, pro-life Catholics, by the way, had already been making that argument for several years. Evangelicals had never really been pro-choice, but when they became full converts to the pro-life cause, they made their campaign against abortion part of a larger political program to turn back the tide of the sexual revolution, the blurring of traditional gender roles, and the secularization of American government and culture, as, as Kristen argued. It, in other words, opposition to Roe offered them a way to, to blend uh, their concerns about sex and gender with concerns about secularization. Uh, Again, Kristen talked a little bit about that theme. Because the evangelical pro-life campaign combined a social justice rationale, the claim to save the lives of a marginalized group, with a culturally conservative political program, it appealed to evangelicals on both the left and the right. Ron Sider, for instance, a progressive evangelical who wrote the book Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, endorsed the pro-life cause, as did cultural conservatives such as James Dobson and Jerry Falwell Sr. Because the evangelical conversion to the pro-life cause had been so heavily focused on opposition not just to abortion but to Roe v. Wade, their pro-life activism took the form of demanding a repeal of the decision. Many evangelicals were already more politically conservative and devoted to free market economics than Catholics were, and they were more likely to be Republicans, especially if they lived in the suburban Sunbelt. They therefore found it easy to combine their, their, their pro-life activism with a broader Christian right agenda. And whereas many Catholics of the early 1970s had made the fight against abortion part of a larger campaign for respect for human life, evangelical pro-life activists of the late 20th century and beyond were more likely to make their battle against abortion part of this larger campaign against secular values in the sexual revolution. They had no qualms about allying the pro-life cause with the Republican Party, especially when it seemed to be the only path to overturning Roe v. Wade. And it was thus no surprise that when Roe v. Wade was finally overturned last year, most of the states that restricted or banned abortion were not heavily Catholic states, but rather the ones where evangelical Christians had significant political influence. The, the current political contours on abortion have their roots in a late 20th century religious shift, and as much of the country becomes more secular, the divide between regions of the country that eschew both evangelicalism and anti-abortion politics and the regions that remain evangelical and strongly opposed to abortion is likely to become even more stark. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, I think it's given us a lot to think about and hopefully discuss. Some of the questions are coming in. Please uh, take some time to do that, and I will take the moderator's privilege to ask a few. Um, I'd like to start with Aziz, actually. Um, you mentioned, I think, this interesting thing about how we think about science and courts and how these sort of, um, how we can think about the trust of those two in restoring, perhaps. There's a broad sort of skepticism of institutions and, and elite networks that is going on, especially in conservative politics. Um, but at the same time, there's now gr a growing real skepticism about the courts, especially in democratic politics. I mean, the, in last fall, Gallup released a poll, which they do frequently, and said that the Supreme Court is at its lowest level of institutional public trust in the history of, of the poll. Um, and that obscures the greatest level of political polarization in how they view the court, this was the Supreme Court especially, right? Republicans strongly thinking that it's doing a good job, and Democrats uh, very much thinking the opposite. And so how do we figure out how to think about uh, expertise and elite trust in courts and science when perhaps our societal trust is moving in different directions? Yeah, thank you. I, I think that in some ways what you're describing, which we've all been hearing a lot about, is the product of the two strategies that have been taken by the left and the right. And, you know, I think on the right, there has always been 
and you know you could you could call it though I don't think anyone on the right would call it this you could call it a sort of deep critique of science you know there's been the idea always that facts should be remade to reflect what people are saying in on the right among conservatives that institutions can be remade you know enter the very powerful conservative legal movement enter the nomination of judges conservatives have long put faith in the idea that they can remake institutions um, to essentially reflect their political projects i think the liberal project over the last you know at least over the last 50 years has been to say that we should build these institutions in a way that make them neutral um, that make them um, sort of deferential to experts, um, that the institutions themselves have, there's something about the institutions themselves that we can preserve. And part of what I'm trying to do in my work or think about in my work is how that has created such massive blind spots for liberal and progressive causes, because progressives haven't been willing to um, say, no, that there is something about the politics of these institutions that we should be paying attention to it. And it reminded me, you know, I, I thought about this a lot when Trump was elected, because something you heard a lot from uh, liberals was that the, um, it's, not, it's not as big of a deal as we think, because um, the institutions will protect us. Our American institutions were too strong. And it just reflected this kind of deep faith we have in institutional politics, which is now, I think, why progressives are sort of dismayed that this institutional thing, this, this body that they've been working towards is failing them, and conservatives are sort of reaping the, uh, the, the, a victory um, in something they've invested in for many decades. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, I wanted to ask you about especially I think your work on the role of gender politics in evangelical spaces, white evangelical spaces particularly. What do you make of, I think, the obvious and, and uh, efforts to have women leading a lot of the pro-life groups? Uh, and how does that intersect with the way that you think about gender and religion in other spaces? Yeah, um, I mean, even the way you phrase that, it's almost like it's a ploy, right? And, and it, or, or it wasn't meant to be that way, right. but yes, so I mean, sure. it could be. It's, it is obviously strategic, um, but it is also um, because conservative women genuinely embrace these ideals. You know, so on the Catholic side, we could talk uh, Phyllis Schlafly, um, Beverly LaHaye, um, uh, Mirabel Morgan, and others going back to the 60s and 70s and um, see how. Um, uh, conservative evangelical women have led anti-feminist efforts, and um, and they did so quite w with with um, a lot of satisfaction, uh, taking on feminists, right, um, and showing that feminists did not speak for all women, and. Um, in, in many ways, I think their uh, message was so um, effective because they had a point. Um, they were speaking, particularly in the in the 60s and 70s, issues around labor, around um, you know women should have a career versus be homemakers. Um, the perspective of conservative evangelical women appealed to many working class women because um, the the allures of a career really weren't much um, if that meant um, basically you know minimum wage kind of work with no benefits why would you want to leave your home um, and um, women of color also have spoken into this as well so so I think that conservative evangelical women had um, uh, you know, embraced this worldview, but then also had the power to take on feminists and appeal more broadly. Um, so there are class issues there, and um, and there are you know, issues of, of genuine belief. Um, this is a kind of cultural worldview, and, and so I think it's important to recognize just how um, deeply held these um, views are, especially on an issue like abortion, that for generations now, evangelicals have been um, taught from the pulpit in their, you know, religious study groups, small groups, um, in their in their communities, that this is God's truth, and that there are many people who hold very deeply to those convictions. Thank you, Dan. We're getting a, uh, several inquiries, and I think it's quite appropriate to think about how we have a sort of robust discussion of, of white Christians and white evangelicals on, uh, up here today, and I, and I think it's important for. It's a lot of the reasons you all talked about. But are we missing something by 
elevating those political events and conversations that perhaps our prior panels today and last night about the, the role of race in the politics of abortion, um, has something been missed or can we learn something about the politics of minority religious groups in the United States as it relates to abortion? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I'm very interested in looking further at the politics of um, African American Protestants in particular and uh, Hispanics. I think the, in fact, I'm hoping to do some writing on that as part of a, a book project that I'm beginning on uh, the religious uh, framework for um, understandings of abortion from before Roe to the, to the present. But what I can say about um, African Americans is that during the 1970s, African Americans were even more likely to oppose abortion than, than white Catholics, who were the group that was most likely to be opposed. So if you look at a number of, of civil rights activists in the 1970s, people like Jesse Jackson, they were not only pro-life, but often very vocally pro-life. Um, in general, they, uh, the, their perspective on the issue was, uh, was informed by their perspective on poverty uh, and race, and they believed that the pro-choice movement was um, opposed to the interests of African Americans and that uh, if you favor the rights of the marginalized, you should favor the rights of the unborn who were also marginalized. Some of them, including Jesse Jackson at the time, uh, envisioned themselves as potentially being the victims of abortion had abortion been legal uh, because of the circumstances in which uh, they were conceived and born. Later, some of those people would change on the issue, and Jesse Jackson was one. Uh, and so as, uh, the, as the pro-life movement became very closely associated with the politics of the Republican Party, including the economic politics of the Republican Party, it became increasingly less attractive to many African Americans. So for a while, there was strong moral opposition to abortion, uh, but, but some hesitancy on, on supporting the, the pro-life cause if that meant legal prohibitions, and then more recently, and this is actually very recent, it's a 21st century shift. We've started to see um, a shift in the younger generation of African Americans in particular toward a fairly strong uh, support for the reproductive rights movement. Uh, among Hispanics, there has been, in general, and I guess up to the present, uh, a fairly strong uh, opposition to abortion, uh, the, and that's been true among Hispanic Catholics and also among Hispanics who have become Protestant, usually charismatic evangelical Protestant. In fact, uh, support for, for legal restrictions on abortion is, is particularly high among uh, Hispanic charismatic Protestants. So I think that adding race to the conversation is really important. The reason I did not do that in, my, uh, in the paper that I presented is because there's only so much that you can do in 10 minutes. And my real interest in, in this and trying to decide, okay, what, what could I say that would be useful would be explaining how we got to the point that we are in terms of a polarized politics. And unfortunately, that's been very much a white conversation on both sides. And so the conversation that I gave you in terms of southern states, uh, why, did, why did the particular states that made abortion heavily restricted or illegal during the past year, why did those states choose to do so? That largely is a white story. Kristen, if we may stay on the topic of race, but in slightly different direction, there's some uh, discussion to ask for a little bit more information on um, the pushback against the thesis that uh, racial politics is what drove particularly white evangelicals into opposition of abortion. And you know, I think most prominently uh, put forward by Randall Balmer, the historian. Uh, and so uh, some people were asking for a little bit more sure. information or clarity on that, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is Randall Balmer's uh, thesis uh, uh, in a few years back in Politico. It carried this, and that kind of went viral, and it, it resurfaces regularly. And uh, what he says there is true in as much as we're talking about the, um, the early political mobilization of conservative evangelicals during this party realignment moving into um, Republican Party and what were some of their, their original kind of mobilizing issues precisely because of what, what Dan was explaining here. Party politics looked very different in 1970, 1971, right? In the 60s, certainly. 
Um, look at who are Republicans, who are Democrats, uh, where do conservative evangelicals fit? Um, you know, how is race being um, discussed in this in the Democratic Party uh, in the 60s versus in the 80s, right? So you have all of this change going on. So technically, yes, white evangelicals mobilized politically first around um, protecting school segregation, right? If we look at um, uh, Jerry Falwell Sr., if we look at IRS um, cases around um, kind of protecting white flight academies, private Christian schools. This is where we have the rhetoric, too, of parental authority, um, right? The authority of parents to make decisions for their children without the intrusion of the government. Well, what was the federal government doing that was so intrusive in the 1960s, right? It was forcing uh, desegregation. And now notice that authority of the parents, it, it sounds um, very neutral. What, what is meant there is the authority of white parents to make decisions for their children, right? So all of this is true, and this is part of the deeper history of the mobilization of the Christian right. That said, how I see that thesis especially kind of being used uh, in popular spaces and by progressive activists is in a very flattened way to say that, aha, they are just a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, conservative evangelicals don't care for life. They don't care about the, the um, fetus, right? They're, they're really just racist in disguise, and that's a kind of attractive uh, um, um, kind of theory for, um, for their opponents, I think. Um, what I'm saying as a historian is that oversimplifies things, and it, it, to the point that, you know, it mischaracterizes. And even if you are a progressive activist trying to counter the influence of conservative evangelicals on abortion, uh, a, a kind of uh, flattened history is not going to serve you well. You have to understand that there are these other factors in terms of you know, the things that Dan was talking about, in terms of the sexual revolution, in terms of the significance of gender roles, gender difference, gender traditionalism, and again, that context of Christian nationalism, that all of this comes to play, and we have to hold that together to accurately understand our politics today. It's, it's just not that simple, and it's not a bunch of kind of like a whole community of you know, millions of people that are kind of masking their hidden racism um, really intentionally through this, this kind of wedge issue. Aziza, I wanted to ask you a bit about, and maybe it's unfair, but a bit of a, a political science-y sort of concept. So we talk, political science and political psychology are interested in what this concept of maybe uh, what we call motivated reasoning, that the, I will filter my information through perhaps a more dominant identity. And for us, it's all about partisanship primarily, right? Like this is our sort of super identity and we, we take information through that and then we try to understand that. At the same time, there are a decent amount of people who are not highly polarized on a whole, a whole variety of issues, abortion including. And so how would you think as someone who um, is interested in science and uh, truth seeking and science and law, how do we get past these proclivities of uh, you know, humans processing information and, and, and having opinions? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you can answer it, we can, we can just finish it today, you know? Yeah. You know, I don't know whether I should answer it by saying, we can do it. You know, we can get to a place where information is information and knowledge is knowledge, and we would, buy, you know, we all know what the true facts are about abortion and or if I should answer by saying, I, I don't think we're actually going to ever get there. And part of what I'm trying to say is that judges exercise quite a lot of motivated reasoning in your sure. terminology. And that by recognizing the role of the judge as, you know, an actor, as a player. Um, and I, I, you know, this conversation, in some ways, it's easier for me to make this claim in the, with this court and with COVID and, you know, everything that's happened in the past five years when I started this work you know, five or before COVID, people would say to me, like, the CDC is not political, Aziza. Like, you can't write about that, you know? <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's not an agency that would ever be like the other yeah. agencies, you know? And, um, and, and, I'm, uh, and that's not what I was reading and writing about in, in the historical work I was trying to do on HIV AIDS in, in another book project. So I, I, I think what I'm trying to actually say is that we should be paying more attention to, you know, how actors are, um, are, are biased. And this includes judges, that we need to bring these institutions into our discussions about um, politics and not 
um, you know, hang up signs outside of our house necessarily that say science is real and human rights are human rights, or I can't remember what the science exactly said, but you know, in the sense, because you know, it, 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 it reflects a sort of purposeful ignorance of, of a much more complicated story that we have to tell about how information is being received and heard and by who. As a follow-up, in the post-Dobbs world with sort of the federation of abortion uh, questions, does that make it easier or harder? What do you mean? To, 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 um, to think about expertise and to think about political actors and legal yeah. actors. You know, as, as we go from, I think, primarily a federal question, right, and yeah. looking at, looking oh, at a particular court, and we, we move that down to 50 states and varieties of different movements and actors, right. um, does it allow positive experimentation or does it devolve some of these discussions into to, to worse actors? Well, it's hard to say because I, you know, I think at the state level, we, there has been a lot more receptivity in conservative states, to example, to hear, uh, to hear from some of these um, sort of uh, uh, conservative thinkers and writers who are publishing in the science space. Um, they're given a lot of bandwidth. They offer a lot of expert testimony. But this is, it's also true that they would show up at a, at a sort of federal hearing. You know, it's not true that that's ne necessarily relegated to one space or the other. So I don't, I don't know that it's just the move to the states that has produ will produce a particular outcome. So I guess I would reframe the question a little bit to say, or I would answer the question a little bit differently to say that in each of those processes, whether at the state level or the federal level, or in the administrative law space, let's say at the FDA or CDC, we have to be looking at how the specific institutional mechanisms that exist, the rules that exist in that, in that space actually limit or allow for a particular type of argumentation to occur on, on, on that side and, and what's facilitated by those rules and institutional mm -hmm. practices. So many good questions. I'm trying to, to, to fill through as we go. Dan, I wanted to fo follow up on a similar question with you, but as as you think about religious social movements, as, it, as we move from federal questions about a constitutional right to an abortion to state level restrictions and state constitutions and, and those sorts of things, um, there's been some states, surprisingly perhaps, that haven't gone as far as some may have expected. Florida may be one. There's a comment about Oklahoma, I think Oklahoma City perhaps, um, requiring um, some more exceptions than others were pushing for. What, what do you think, uh, the sort of state level fracturing does for uh, the religious pro-life movement, for example? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a great question because obviously we're at a new political moment. The evangelical pro-life movement was formed largely in the aftermath of Roe. There was, there was evangelical pro-life writing before Roe, but the movement itself formed after Roe and it very it was very heavily focused, more so I would argue than the Catholic pro-life movement on overturning Roe as its, its end goal, that Roe was the symbol of everything that it, that it opposed. Um, I, I think Kristen is absolutely right in saying that the, the pro-life identity though for, for white evangelicals is, it runs very deep. And because the uh, Dobbs decision did not uh, radically reduced the abortion rate. It marginally reduced the number of abortions in the United States, but not radically so. And in many states, actually, people on the ground are going to see an expansion in abortion services. Therefore, it creates um, some new ad additional, uh, a new, new additional goals. And so I, I suspect that the movement, you know, I've been asked several times in the last couple of weeks leading up to the, the March for Life by various reporters, well, what's going to happen to the pro-life movement? And, and I really think the answer is uh, it will continue. Um, that the, it, It's so clear to most people who are involved in this that, that Dobbs did not provide uh, any final answer, that therefore life can continue a, as it did last year and the year before. Um, that whatever the pro-life activists, most of the pro-life activists who were marching, uh, demonstrating in front of clinics will still be able to do that this year in their own states. Um, the states that, that made abortion illegal were mostly states that had very few abortion clinics left anyway. And the people that have been investing in crisis pregnancy centers will still be able to do that. Uh, so I, I think that there will, will be a national um, pro-life ideology that will continue, that will be relatively uh, cohesive and unified and, and national in orientation, and there will be a lot of different state manifestations that you know may have different 
local goals, depending on what a state legislature is debating or, or the presence or absence of a crisis pregnancy center in a particular community. Uh, but I, I think that, that there will not be any sort of soul searching of identity for the most part for people who have already been involved uh, in the evangelical pro-life movement. Christian, if I may direct this to you, um, your most recent book is called Jesus and John Wayne, and in some sense deals with uh, authoritarianism, uh, uh, I would say sort of violence and gender in, in evangelical politics. Some had said, you know, even, uh, why, have, why aren't we talking more about misogyny when, it, when we talk about uh, abortion and religion and politics? And so uh, I, I push, put that question to you. Yes, uh, we certainly could. And so within evangelical discourse, right, uh, you will not, um, uh, pro-life discourse, this is about valuing women and caring for women and enabling women to do what God made them to do, which is to have many children. Children are a blessing from God, right? Um, so, so that's the uh, kind of pro-life discourse. Um, but what that looks like is, you know, a fairly coercive model of making sure that women do what God made them to do. And uh, so it really is impossible to separate the political mobilization around abortion and this kind of, as it moves to the center of evangelical identity, from this more coercive side, which is exercised by evangelicals first and foremost in their own communities, right? So uh, uh, women in these spaces are taught, now, do, now evangelicalism is, is like it's kind of a spectrum, so you can get very far right, kind of fundamentalist um, spaces, and then all the way up to more progressive and even an evangelical left. But the majority of white evangelicals are going to be what, what, is, what, what they call complementarian, which is patriarchal, but in a nice way. Um, <laughs> and so men and women have these complementary gender roles, right? Men are providers, protectors, um, and providers, okay, kind of breadwinner, so women should be at home, and protectors. This is where you can get justification for violence, protecting their families. So look at surveys on, on firearms and you know, uh, gun culture, um, militarism, protecting the nation, and protecting the truth, protecting God's truth. And now women are um, more vulnerable, need to be protected, right? And they are created to submit to masculine authority and to fulfill their roles here, right? Now, is that misogynistic, <laughs> you know? Most of you are all like, oh yeah, of course it is, right? And in evangelical spaces, that is enabling women to thrive in the way that they are created to thrive. Now what happens if they say, I'd rather not, <laughs> right? Um, and, and that's where it can get more coercive inside those spaces. Uh, and so there are harrowing stories of women um, in the far right um, in terms of like there's a stay-at-home daughter movement. There are some rather extreme examples of kind of patriarchal rule, patriarchal authority. But even in the mainstream, um, there are, are um, clear restrictions around what women can and should do. Uh, and so, you know, we can use the word misogyny, is that hatred of women. I think that is maybe um, applies a little bit more um, it, accurately or, or, or maybe um, more broadly anyway, um, but in terms of deep antagonism towards women who are not fulfilling their role uh, as uh, their God-ordained role and against women who are discouraging their women from doing so. So those are kind of the spaces or how, how I would field that question in terms of where, where is misogyny present. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a bit of a lightning round here uh, uh, to get, I, I want to pose to all of you, what is something that we should, uh, as people interested in uh, abortion, law, public life, political movements, what's something that perhaps it's not on the front burner that we should be on the lookout for in the next couple of years, five years, decade, that um, what are you seeing in the, in the scholarship or the, the connections that you have that we as citizens who are engaged in this topic might want to pay close attention to? Uh, we'll start with Dan and we're just going to move right down the panel. Okay. Um, I would say that 
we need to recognize that the abortion debate continues to change and involves a lot of shifting coalitions um, and reframing of issues. So when we look back in the past, uh, certainly if we look back 50 years ago, the uh, politics of abortion look in certain ways almost unrecognizable today. And so if we understand that, that even though the public opinion polls have shown a relative um, constant number of, of Americans uh, on either side of the question, the particular groups that made up any of those coalitions, I, I'm convinced, the more that I study this, they're, they're shifting uh, quite a bit. Uh, so you have people moving in and moving out of these different issue positions. And so that's what I would look for over the next 10 years. I would say that um, I think in evangelicalism there will be a small number, uh, but very vocal number, of um, people who've considered themselves to be progressive evangelicals and have even questioned whether they should be calling themselves evangelical or calling themselves something else, uh, who will do what progressive evangelicals have not done for the last uh, 40 years, which is take uh, an overtly reproductive rights stance on the, in terms of social justice. I think in terms of, of centrist evangelicals, you will start to see growing divisions between different groups of pro-life evangelicals over strategy. And they will have to struggle to hold the coalition together. Let's... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, okay. In, the, in, in regard to lightning, we'll move on then. Yeah. But thank you. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, I, I'll keep on with the theme of my presentation. And I, I just wanted to say that, you know, something... Uh, as I've looked at a lot of archival materials, and, and, you know, you read the materials of the Black Panthers. You look at what ACT UP was doing. You look at the, Black, uh, the Boston Women's Health Collective. There was some, something unique about the 1960s and 70s that led people to question institutions and expertise, to mimic expertise for the sake of a more progressive redistribution of goods and material goods. And, and, I think as fa and, and I think these things change fast. And I guess if I were to say to pay attention to something, it would be to pay attention to how these ideas, how these facts about the world are changing. You know, for progressives to revisit that earlier point in time when we had and could call upon um, could call upon this critique. And we're sort of in a moment of it now. You know, you get, we're having a lot of questions raised about the way race is being used in science, for example, inspired by the work of Dorothy Roberts and Michelle and Carol, a lot, a lot of the women here. Um, and, you know, I, and, and I'm watching it and I'm thinking we have to pay attention to this space more because we don't want to miss when the backlash begins, you know, and, and, and how can we do that? All right, I'll stop. Okay, uh, I would say that we're rightly focusing on this polarization, uh, but, but to keep an eye on what is beneath that polarization, the polarized kind of categories are promoted by leadership, by organizations that benefit from that polarization. Still, if you look at survey data, there is more like fluidity in, inside even white evangelicals and even white evangelicals who um, think abortion should be illegal. And so I would say maybe in the the spirit of some of the morning's conversations to, to look for some common ground, to, um, to create space for um, others um, to enter into this conversation who may not share your orthodoxies. Um, but I think that polarization has tended to work to the advantage of conservatives in a, a kind of reactionary populist moment and that we would do well probably for the sake of our democracy to work to um, uh, listen to and seek out and even strengthen some of those voices occupying a middle ground. Thank you, and uh, thank you all. And I will end um, my part, and I will ask uh, Jane to come and send us off. Thank you all for that extraordinarily fine-grained, deeply archival and empirical work um, in this conversation. Um, I also get the sense of how much we're longing to launch into the future, um, which is our next panel and our, uh, and our concluding session at, uh, at 3 o'clock.